man and woman that goes to war anywhere would learn to claim those promises and put God first, I can guarantee you on the word of the living God, they can come back without a scratch. Some of you mothers never learn to give up your sons. I remember a woman one time when I was at, over in Louisville, and her son was 18 years old, and my son was considerably younger than him. But we were there talking that night, and so the kids didn't want to talk about what we were talking about as adults. So they went out in the front yard and just got in the car. And this 18-year-old son of theirs, he was still in the car talking with my son whenever we got ready to go, which was about 10, 30, or 11 o'clock that night. And she just jumped on that 18-year-old boy and said, you know, you should have stayed in the house. And as she jumped on him and chewed him out and told him what he should have done and everything else, I told her, I said, ma'am, that boy's 18. I said, you as a mother need to get off of his case. You need to let him be a man. I said, young boys don't like for mothers doing these kind of things. In fact, I'll tell you how even with a dad, when Tim was only about this big, he was going to go on a church outing with Brother Ben Smith. He was going to be the leader of about 10 boys. He had a whole carload of boys. I mean, had them all packed in his car, taking them up to the church camp for uh, a week. And I just barely got there from work in time to see them off. I come running up to the car and jerked the car door open. And, and Tim, when I did, Tim stuck his hand out like this. And so I reached down and shook his hand. And I said, son, y'all have a good trip. And I turned him loose. When they got back, Brother Ben said, if I ever saw a man of wisdom, it was Thurman. He was coming after that boy to hug him and kiss him on the cheek and say, son, I love you. When he's didn't boy did not want to be intimidated for all them other boys, he wanted to look like a man. So he stuck his hand out and said, you shook it and said, have a good trip, son. See you when you get back. He said, that's the way the boy wanted to be treated. He did not want you to be burbling all over him, kissing him, <laughs> licking on him, telling him you're my baby and all that stuff. And he was only probably 11 or 12. He still wanted to be treated like a man. And some of you mothers never turn your boys loose. You treat them like babies. And they're not babies. They want to be men. Y'all know where I'm coming from? If you've got children, I don't care, some of you, I, I look at Kim here, she's got these, her and Scott's got these boys, I'm sure that there's times when she grabs them boys and holds them by the head and kisses them on the head and everything else. Well, there's a, there's a right place for that, but there's going to be times when them kids are going to be around other kids that's new kids, and they ain't going to want mama to do that. They're, they're going to want you to stay your ground, mama. I'm a boy. I'm a man. You see what I mean? Yeah, that's okay when they get home. You know, they, they love that kissing and hugging whether you're at home with you, but they don't want to be done like that when they're out there, especially with new friends. They want to be a man. And I thought about that woman. I told her, I said, you know, you really need to turn that boy loose. And she thought about that, and she later did turn the boy loose. And she said, you know the hardest thing I ever did, Thurman? I said, what? She said, well, I had to turn him loose, like you said, and let him be his own man. When he come in at, and when he got to be 19 and 20, he still lived with them at home for a while. But when you say, Mom, I'm going to do this, she say, yes, son. You know, she didn't try to run his life no more. She let him be his own man. And you, some mothers, you know, they just have to turn their kids loose. You children must always obey your parents, for this is what pleases the Lord. T 21 and 22. Fathers, don't aggravate your children. If you do, they will become discouraged and quit trying. Now, this is one of the things that, this is what I tried my best to do as I was raising, as we were raising our children. Every time they come and ask me for something, I thought about what they said. Is there any reason that I would have to say no? You know, can I say yes to what they, their requests? Because I noticed in parents, one of the children walk up and say, Dad, can I go home with Tim? And the man say, no. 
No. And I got to pay attention to parents. And some of them, they ain't even listening to what their children are asking. They just say no. Well, you're aggravating your children, and your children are going to get to where if the only answer you have is no, they're going to stop asking. They're going to do what they want to do, and then if there's a consequence to suffer, they'll just suffer the consequence. But I learned that lesson. I don't want to aggravate my children. So if they ask for something, I stop and think. Is there a reason why I should say no? In fact, I remember one time when Amanda, the little girl next door, they moved in, a new, new couple. They, they looked like a nice couple, had a little girl about Amanda's age. And, of course, Amanda came over with her and says, Dad, can I go over and spend the afternoon with whatever the little girl's name was? And I thought about it a minute, and I thought, okay, I, I guess so. And so she looked at me kind of strange, and she went over there, and she didn't stay but just a little while. And she came home by herself. She came in, she said, Daddy, now, she's only about six or eight years old. She said, Daddy, why did you say yes? I said, well, you asked me. She said, but Daddy, I wanted to look good in front of my new friend. Daddy, we don't even know them. They just moved in. <laughs> we don't know anything about them. I can't believe you said yes. See, what she wanted me to say was no. Now, isn't that something? She wanted me to say no because she wanted me to at least rationalize like she was doing. She wanted to bring her little friend and said, Dad, can I go and spend the afternoon with Melissa or whatever her name was? And I thought about it a minute and I said, sure, no problem. And I, I, I just, when she just backed off and looked and then she walked out the door with her, I thought, there's something wrong here. I don't know what it was. But Amanda couldn't believe her daddy would let her go home with a new little girl that just moved in that even in the afternoon in the broad daylight, that we don't know anything about this family. She said, well, Daddy, at least you should have went over and met with the family and spent an hour or two with them to find out something about them before you ever say, yes, I can go over there. Isn't that something? Of course. But, you know, today we don't even think about wisdom. But, but you know, the thing about it is by the time Amanda was six or seven or eight years old, whatever she was at that time, I had read the Word of God completely through to her at least twice. At least twice, you know, sir. I started reading the Word of God to Amanda when she was one month old. And Tim was two years old. And I read the Bible to them every night until they got grown. You know, so they heard the Word of God. Where does wisdom come from? The from the Word. And then they hear things in it. You read it to them, they hear things you don't even get. I know, I've been there and done that. But I was amazed that she was so upset with me but, you know, I, I don't want to aggravate my children, so I have learned that if every time one of them comes to me and says, Dad, can I go do this? I said, no. Don't even think about it. Just say, no. Dad, can I go do this? No. Dad, can I do this? No. Well, then you get to where they don't ask. They, they know you're going to say no, so you're going to aggravate them, and they're going to say, why ask Dad? He's going to say no. He never says yes, so we'll just go ahead and do what we want to do, and then we'll suffer the consequences. If there is a consequence... But don't do that to your children. Say yes to your children as much as possible. So when you do say no, they're going to say, what's, what's wrong here? Is there something? Yes, I don't quite understand this situation. So in this case, I'm telling you, you can't do that. Well, they'll accept it then. They'll feel like you're using a little wisdom. Then he says, you slaves must obey your earthly masters. In everything you do. Today, this is employee, uh, employer relationships. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Obey them willingly because of your reverent fear of the Lord. In other words, when, when you become a true son, you work different than you do when you're just an employee. I don't care, you know, I mean, I work for companies, but I never, I knew I was required to put in eight hours a day, five days a week, but I never put in eight hours a day, five days a week. 
9, 10, 11, 12 hours a day was not uncommon for me. And if they called me in, if I had to go in and work on Saturday, I never grumbled and complained. I was working as unto the Lord, not unto them. And the Lord blessed me for doing that. It says, you slaves, you must obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. You know, and there's some people that if you're not watching them, they're goofing off. You know, they really are. You know, they're not, they're not doing anything. Obey them willingly because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Well, people don't have reverent fear of God. They don't realize that God is watching you 24-7. You know, I think about this man that his father-in-law come to him one day, and this guy was a contractor. His father-in-law come to his son-in-law, which was a contractor, and he told him, he said, I want you to build me the most beautiful 2,000 square foot house uh, that you've ever built. I don't want to cut no corners, nowhere. I want it to be beautiful. And I will pay you whatever it takes, but I want a perfect house. And so the son-in-law thought, hmm, okay, this is one time I'll get my father-in-law. I'll build, and everywhere I can cut a corner, I will cut a corner, but I'll charge him for the most, the best. And so he got the house built. The father-in-law wasn't there when he was building it, so he didn't know what he was doing. So when he got back, he said, it looked beautiful on the outside. You know, he did look like he didn't cut any corners anywhere. So whenever he got home and he said, okay, it's built just like I want. He said, yeah, and it cost you this much money to build it. I didn't spare no cost nowhere. So he gave him the check and said, okay, good. Here is this, this house. I'm glad you built it perfect. He said, now then, and he handed him the keys and he said, okay, now then let me give you the keys. This is what I built for you and my daughter-in-law. Would that get to you? Yeah. Your father-in-law told you to build a house, cut no corners, because he knew you and your daughter-in-law, was going, his daughter, was going to live in that the rest of your life. He wanted to be perfect. And you cut every corner you could. Now this sucker's going to fall apart on you, and you're going to be living in it. <laughs> Do you reap what you sow? Yes. Isn't that something? God told us we reap what our sow, what we sow. So he said, not just when they're watching you. Now, if the, if the, if the father-in-law had been there and watching this house being built every day and knew what he was doing, he couldn't have cut no corners, could he? No. But see, is God always there watching you and me? He knows everything we're doing, everything we're thinking. He knows everything. So you, you can't cut no corners with God. Next two verses. Work hard and cheerfully at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. You know, if that Colossians 3.23, I learned that by heart years ago in a Baptist church. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as unto the Lord and not unto man. Because the Lord is going to give you your inheritance or your reward. Remember, work hard and cheerfully at whatever you do, as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and the master you're serving is Christ. Why do we work so hard around here? We are all know here we're working for the Lord. Everything we're doing is unto God. He's going to take care of it, and he blesses us. Amen. He blesses us. I got tickled at Sharon. Sharon always calls out the trash. You know, I mean, several of the girls around here do, but Sharon, she's a trash hauler. I mean, she'll go to the bathroom, she'll get stuff, and she said, don't worry. I said, I said something one day, I said, well, Sharon, you're just an extra blessing here. That's all there is to it. She says, oh, no, I'll get my reward. I'll get my reward. Well, she got her reward. Didn't you, Sharon? Yeah, she, she, she asked me, her, she, Sharon, had, Sharon, Sharon had some money, and she wanted another car. And so she asked me if I would look for her a car. So I started looking and looking and looking and looking. I finally found her for the money she had, I found her a two, well, we, th we were thinking we were going to get one about 
a 96 or a 97 or somewhere along there. Maybe a, uh, I mean a 99 or maybe a 2000, maybe a 2002 or three. But we didn't dream that we were going to find a 2011 with 10,000 miles on it for the money she had. But we found her almost, I mean, it's perfect, exactly what she wanted, had everything on it she wanted, and it's beautiful and perfect, and it's a 2011 with 10,000 miles. I told her, that's your trash reward. That's how God, that's how God blessed you for taking out the trash. You see where I'm coming from? Because she didn't ask nobody to do it. She just did it. You know, she's working as unto the Lord. She's doing, but everybody, everybody around here works like that. I will have to say, we all do different things, and God takes care of us. Amen. He takes care of us. In some way or another, God takes care of all of us here at the Ministry Center. I am so grateful that I work for the Lord, Amen. that I don't work for somebody else. I'm working for Jesus, and somebody's got to be in control, you know, but outside of the Lord, then that's why he put me in here. You know, I'm supposed to be the spiritual head or the king of this castle, I call myself. I'm the king of this castle. And so I make the final decisions. You know, sometimes they don't like them, but that's okay. I'm responsible. God holds me responsible. So anyway, I'm so grateful for what he does. Remember, the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. I got a feeling this inheritance is a lot bigger than a car, Sharon. You know that? I, that's just part of it. But I remember, I, the, the, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and the master you're serving is Christ. Verse 25. There's a but and an if. Like I say, every time you see a but and an if together, you better really read it carefully. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done. For God has no favors who can get away with evil. Does God let any of his children get away with evil? No. Unfortunately, you're going to pay the consequence. You may think, well, I'm working for a guy somewhere, anywhere. You may be working for somebody and you may say, well, you know, uh, I will uh, go up behind the building and sleep tonight. Uh, then I'm, I'm on the duty and there is not a whole lot to do, so I'll just hide out for two or three hours and take a nap. The people do that. You know that? <laughs> and then they wonder why, especially if they're God's child, they wonder why they get judged or some kind of sickness and disease, or, you know, one day, it's amazing, amazing one night, uh, I had been to a, I was a manager for a big outfit down at DFW Airport. And I'd been having trouble with a, little trouble with a boiler. And so I thought, I went to this Christian organization and teaching and everything, I got through about 10, and 10 or 30 or 11, whatever it was, and I thought, well, I'll run by the plant, I'll come back by DFW Airport, and so about 12 or 12.30 in the morning, I just come in the back door, you know, I mean, I ain't trying to be quiet or nothing, I mean, I'm not paying, of course, there's a lot of noise in a boiler room, with the boilers running and all that kind of stuff, pumps running and everything else, so I just walked in, went up top to the second floor on the ladder and walked around the boiler, and there set with the newspaper in front of me was one of my men, I stood there a minute and I looked and I hollered his name and he tucked that newspaper down. I said, what are you doing? He, oh, he said, I just come up here to check the baller. So I thought I'd stop and read the newspaper. I said, you read the newspaper in the cafeteria. I said, you don't read the newspaper up here. You work on the job. I said, you know, if we were not a union here at this place, I'm telling you what I would do with you, son. I would fire you. I said, because I know you were goofing off. You were not up here. You were hiding. I said, it's obvious you got on the second floor behind the boiler and hid so nobody else. I said, there's nobody going to come in this equipment room but somebody like me, and you certainly didn't expect me out here at midnight. But I said, I want to serve you notice. You never know when I'm liable to show up. But I said, son, the main thing, if you're a Christian, God is sitting right there with you watching you steal from this company. And I said, you'll pay the consequences. Did it say so? 
You think you're getting to buy with something when you're trying to steal from your employer? You ain't getting by with nothing. You're going to pay. I don't want to be one of those. Do you want to be one of those that is one of those sloppy, non-productive people, and yet you call yourself a Christian? I want everybody to think there's the best guy in town. You want something fixed, get him. He'll do the best job in town. That's the way you want to be known, Lou? Should be. Sure. It keeps you busy. But if you treat people right and you do things right, God is the one that's behind you. He's the one that will keep you busy. It's not anybody else. It's just doing things for the Lord. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites who can get away with evil. I want to go to 2 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 1, and I want to show you some things about what we talked about today, about today's kind of church. 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will clearly teach their destructive heresies about God and even turn against their master who bought them, theirs will be a swift and terrible end. How would you like to be one of these guys today that's teaching something that's contrary to God's word? I mean, look what he said. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there would be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach their destructive heresies about God and even turn against their master who bought them. Theirs will be a swift and terrible end. Many will follow their evil teachings and shameful immorality, and because of them, Christ in his true way will be slandered. Just like the woman out there in the parking lot the other day. When she's screaming at me, I told her, I said, you know, I'll tell you why you got the problem you got. She said, why is that? I said, because you sleep with every man in town. You know, you have sex with anybody you want to. I said, you brought all these children into the world, and you ain't worthy of being a mother. I said, that's your problem. That's your problem. I said, you're paying your consequences. She said, I said, I thought you said you were a Christian. Well, I am. I said, well, you ain't much of one woman. I said, if you sleep with a man you ain't married with and have children, you ain't much of a Christian woman. I guarantee you. She said, well, I went to the Baptist preacher where I was going to church, and I asked him if it would be okay if I lived with this man. And he said, yes, just repent after you do it. I said, you got some rotten advice, woman. I said, you need to come here, and I'll teach you the truth. Well, she came a couple of times, and now that she's not here no more because she heard the truth and she didn't like it. That's why you ain't never going to build a mega church with my teaching. When I was in Amagarda, New Mexico, the pastor there, 400 people. Three nights we were out there and the last night when we got through, he got up before the people there and said, well, I'll say one thing about Thurman. He won't never have a big church. A pastor said that about me. And I'd preach in your church for three nights in a row. He said, you won't never have a big church because you teach it just like it's written and said people don't want to hear what you got to say. I thought, wow. I know one that wants to hear what I got to say. You know who he is? God. And I don't care if I please nobody but him. He's the one that's going to give me my reward one day when I get home. It ain't going to be nobody else. I want to obey him and do what he says because I want you to know exactly what he said so the Holy Spirit will convict you and you'll go out and become that loving, sweet, pure, clean, holy individual that he wants you to be. Is that the way to be? Amen. Amen. That's the way we want it to be. Many will follow their evil teachings and shameful immorality. 
Look at what's going on today. We got so many men and women in Congress and the Senate that's open homosexuals today. I mean, that guy they just put in charge that's writing the rules now for the schools. He's an open homosexual and he's going to require that these sexual acts of homosexuality be practiced in the classrooms. I thought my kids ain't going to no school where they do that. I may have to die first, but they ain't going. I just can't believe, you know, that these shameful, immoral things, and because of them, Christ and his true way will be slandered. So what do we do? Go out and we live like the devil and tell everybody, I'm a Christian. Don't you tell me you're a Christian if you're living like the devil. You know, if you're going to church and you're out sleeping with somebody, you're lying to somebody, you're cheating somebody, you're living in sexual immorality, don't tell me you're a Christian. You need to get saved. You don't know the first thing about who God is. That's not his word. His word demands purity, does it not? It demands it. Wow. So if I tell you, yes, I'm a Christian, but it's okay, go ahead and do that. You know, yeah, you can live with that girl out of wedlock. It's okay, God understands. I'm going to tell you, that's not what this book teaches. Next two verses. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. Boy, some of them do that all right. But God commanded them long ago. God condemned them long ago, and their destruction is on the way. You know where those men are going to wind up? In hell, that's exactly right. Their destruction's on the way. For God did not spare even the angels when they sinned. So what do you, how do you think you're going to get away with this? If God did not spare even the angels when they sinned, he threw them into hell in gloomy caves and darkness until the judgment day. Next, four, five and six. And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and his family of seven. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. Then God destroyed the whole world of ungodly people with a vast flood. I was in the bank the other day, and I made, somebody said something about something somebody was doing. I said, well, you know, they'll want to quit that as quickly as possible, or God's going to kill them. And one of the little girls there, one of the new girls, she said, Mr. Scrivener, God would never hurt anybody. He's a God of love.